when that happens, are we still constantly looking for how do we be more virtuous? How do we be more like God? How do we better reflect God's spirit living in us? Because it seems like right here, that's exactly what David is doing. It would have been very easy for, for David to walk around with his chest puffed out and being like, God must really love me. I mean, look, I had every opportunity, every motivation to do this thing. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it because that's just the kind of guy that I am. That's not what David did. David did not allow himself to be puffed up by his own pride. And there are other times, other episodes where he does, but right here he doesn't. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, we're going to continue our series in the book of 1 Samuel. Now, you may recall that when we left our heroes, you know, doing a little sort of a, that thing that they do at the beginning of TV shows where they kind of reset everything, give you what happened on the last episode. So here's what's happening here in 1 Samuel. We now see that David has been chased out of the palace. Saul is pursuing him, trying to kill him. He has already killed God's priest in pursuit of him. He has already taken out the city surrounding the priesthood where they hit him and took care of him. And so Saul is on a war path. He is bound and determined to kill David. He wants to take his life because he is terrified David will become king instead of him. And he believes that David is trying to intentionally usurp his throne out from under him. And Saul had to give up the chase for a little bit because there was a report in his shores that the Philistines were attacking Israel. And so he relented from chasing David for just a little bit. David is hiding out in a mountain range area. And so Saul finds out that that's where David is hiding. He comes back after he's dealt with the Philistine threat and now moves into these mountains where David is hiding. So he's out there looking around. And this is where we see the first time that Saul, uh, runs into him. So we'll, we'll look now at 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, it was reported to him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engendi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to search for David and his men in the front of the rocks of the mountain goats. And he came to the sheepfolds on the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. Then David's men said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to hand your enemy over to you, and you shall do with him as it seems good to you. Then David got up and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. But it came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had to cut off he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me, because of the Lord, that I would do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to reach out with my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. And David rebuked his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got up, left the cave, and went on his way. There's several different layers to this story, and we're going to get into the ultimate meaning of it in the next lesson that we look at where we see Saul's response. But just looking at what we have so far, I want you to notice a couple things. David refuses to lay his hand on God's chosen king even though he doesn't get along with them, even though this is a man that is currently pursuing him to take his life, even though his life would be a lot easier and his ascension to the throne a lot easier if he just went ahead and took Saul's life. And by the way, 
God has already promised that he would deliver Saul into David's hand. We see that in this passage. So in other words, God gave him permission and opportunity and said, you can do with him what you want. Can you imagine God actually openly giving you permission for something? God actually giving to you through divine revelation saying, whatever your name is, you can do this. I'm going to make it to where it is. You are able to do this. I'm going to put this directly into your hand. It's going to fall right into your lap. Do what you will. Don't you think you'd probably take that opportunity? I mean, don't you think you could sit there and rationalize in your head, well, God said it was fine. I mean, if that's not the ultimate permission, it's like, I don't know what is. And we even see in other parts of the scripture, people like Abraham, who, even though God didn't give him permission to do this, would, for example, lie about whether or not Sarah was his wife in order to protect himself. See, David has a much more legitimate reason to believe that his life is in danger than Abraham did. And he specifically had God's permission to do this thing that at least could be perceived as incorrect by some people. I mean, it is the taking of a life. But even with God's permission, and even with David legitimately having fear for his life, and God having already promised the throne to him, David says, I won't do it. Doesn't matter that all those factors are in my favor. Doesn't matter that my men are encouraging me to do this. I will not lay my hand on God's anointed. He is God's chosen king. If God wants to take care of him, he will, but I won't do it. Even though God gave me permission to, I still will not lay my hand on God's chosen king. David had every reason in the world, and he still chose not to raise his sword against him. That is an incredible act of mercy. He had Saul in the palm of his hand, and, and by the way, if he was close enough to cut Saul's robe, it means that Saul wasn't wearing it, probably. Because it's, it's very hard to believe that David could have cut Saul's robe off without him noticing if he was wearing the robe at the time. And so what probably happened is when Saul goes in to relieve himself, he removes his robe and, and goes in to do what he needs to do. And then David is close enough to him that while he's doing that, his robe is sitting right there on the cave floor, hanging up in the cave somewhere, and David cuts off a piece of it there. That's how close he is. And yet he still chooses, even though he can do everything, Saul is completely vulnerable and at his mercy, and David still chooses to let him go. That shows an incredible strength of character. I mean, I don't know that I would have had that strength of character. Can you imagine God giving you permission to just take care of your mortal enemy, and you saying, no thanks God, I'm good. That's what David just did. And here's the crazy thing, and I think that this makes it even more impressive. Even after this incredible act of mercy, even after he has shown Saul incredible and completely unjustified kindness, grace, unmerited favor toward Saul, even after that, in sparing his life when he had every right to take it and every motivation to take it, David still feels bad. He still feels wrong that he has cut off a part of Saul's robe as kind of a trophy. And so we'll see what he does with that in the next time, and that's for the next lesson. But I want you to contemplate that for a second. Even after this incredible virtuous act, David still thinks, I can do more. He still thinks in terms of, what would God most want me to do? What would be the ideal for me to do? Because there's so many Christians today that they look at, what's the bare minimum I can get away with? That's really how they approach religion. And I've been guilty of it too, so I'm not casting this just on everybody else, because I'm guilty of this from time to time as well. We think, well, as long as I'm showing up to church and taking the Lord's Supper, and uh, I've already you know, gone through the process of salvation, you know, I'm, I'm basically doing everything God asked me to do. Okay, but 
David did all of that and more already. And he still is looking for more ways to serve God, more ways to do something even more correct than he has already done to be more pleasing to his creator. That's the kind of attitude that Christians should be seeking after. That even after you've done something virtuous, and it may actually be virtuous, you know, I'm using the air fingers quote because it could be a false virtue, but it also could be the real thing, just like it was with David here too. When that happens, are we still constantly looking for how do we be more virtuous? How do we be more like God? How do we better reflect God's spirit living in us? Because it seems like right here, that's exactly what David is doing. It would have been very easy for, for David to walk around with his chest puffed out and being like, God must really love me. I mean, look, I had every opportunity, every motivation to do this thing. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it because that's just the kind of guy that I am. That's not what David did. David did not allow himself to be puffed up by his own pride. And there are other times, other episodes where he does, but right here he doesn't. Right here, David is not looking at this incredible act of grace and mercy and saying, yep, I did pretty well today. He's saying, you know what? I probably shouldn't even have taken off his robe. You have to understand in their culture, this would have been a shameful thing. Not for David to have taken it. It would have been a shameful thing for Saul to have lost it. And so now he's gone so far above and beyond what God asked him to do. He's not only spared Saul's life. He has not only completely kept his men from doing it, because then you would even have plausible deniability. He's like, yeah, I didn't kill them, but you know, my, I told my men it was fine if they wanted to. David wouldn't do that either. But now he's even going the extra mile and going, I actually don't think I should have taken part of his robe. That humiliated the king, and that's not something I should have done. And so, even when we are engaged in an act of virtue, even when we are doing the best that we can, the worst thing that we could do is think about how virtuous and good we are. Think about how good we're doing. And, and I'm not saying we should be self-loathing at all. I'm just saying that when we do something virtuous, our automatic reaction would be, I really hope that God is pleased with that. What are the ways that I can do now to do even better? How could I be even more virtuous? How could I even better reflect God's spirit living within me to the world? That's the attitude we should have because we see David adopting exactly that. You see, righteousness is not for our glory. It's our duty. It's not something that we can do so that we can put it on a shelf and tell other people how great we are. That's pride. Virtue, which comes from righteousness, wanting to be in a right relationship with God, wanting to be pleasing to Him, is not something that we should glory in. Rather, it is something that we should acknowledge is the bare minimum. That is our duty. That is what we are called to be as Christians. And the truth is, if we understand our virtue and our, our obligations to God in that manner, that is going to set us on a path that goes a lot farther in making ourselves look like followers of Jesus Christ. Stay the course, friends. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV Guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs>